uh, to make that an open application process, um, not only in ASCII characters but also in internationalised characters. Um, and uh, that process has presently got a, uh, uh, a implementation plan that's out for public consultation. We'll actually do two rounds of that implementation and public consultation process. You'll actually find that as the main item on the front page of the ICANN website, which is ICANN.org. Um, and um, uh, that's been a, a major area of support. I've also managed to leave my phone on, which I'll now turn off. Um, the um, the uh, second big area related to that has been working on internationalised domain names, um, and in particular the implementation for at a fast track process for country code top level domains, but also for generic top level domains. Um, I like to think of this in some respects as um, the domain name system is a little bit like the, the columns in a 15 storey building and we've had the columns in red brick since the beginning and now we're going through the process and changing the bricks and making them multicolour and you have to take them in you know, change them brick by brick the, the key issue here is to ensure that the doors open, the, the, the windows open, the lifts still work while you make that change. It's, a, it's technically a very complicated issue, but we aren't um, and building the capability. A lot of it's about sharing knowledge between the experience of the root server operators and the generic top level domain operators when it comes to cyber attacks and other forms of, of failure and sharing that information with CC operators and building a common set of understandings and, uh, and working through getting people to understand the need for exercises and development of, um, of responses of how to respond in particular circumstances if such things would happen at a country code level. Um, we've also related to that is a proposal we have to sign the route in using DNSSEC technology um, uh, that the uh, US Department of Commerce asked for proposals and presently has a notice of inquiry out on. The um, other big area I would say, a couple of the big areas is, is trying to provide leadership in the um, process of um, V4 to V6 migration. ICANN's own role is somewhat limited. Uh, we have ensured that the uh, the route is V6 enabled. We've ensured the so-called Quad A records are available. Um, we have made certain our own infrastructure has moved across to V6. Um, we have agreed uh, through the bottom-up process coming out of the regional internet registries for a global allocation process for, for V6. Um, and I think a lot of our um, message now is to try to engage people more about the need to make that transition. But perhaps I'll let Paul talk more about the issues that are emerging in that space. Um, another very big issue for ICANN is the process we have for ongoing evolutionary reform. Um, we have drawn conclusions when we looked at other um, international entities about the need to have a process whereby you continually reform. Um, we've seen in, say, for instance, the discussion around reform with the UN, how difficult it can be if you don't have some constitutional framework established for reform. So the ICANN bylaws require for each part of the organisation to undergo review on a rotating three-year basis. And we have a series of reviews underway. One we're just concluding in our generic name supporting organisation. And we have a series of others underway for the nominating committee, for the ICANN board, um, um, for um, the at-large. Um, advisory Council um, and others with the Root Server Operators, for instance, as an example of the Root Server uh, Advisory Committee. So we've got a series of those reviews which we consider to be business as usual, but that's part of ensuring that the organisation evolves to maintain um, relevancy year after year um, and, and to be ensured that it's an institution that can continue to evolve. Also related to that is a, is a process that there's a workshop on tomorrow which is called the President's Strategy Committee's um, work on improving institutional confidence. This is particularly directed to uh, issues raised in a um, midterm review process for the jo joint, op joint partnership agreement we have with the US Department of Commerce. Um, and there's a series of issues there around accountability, improving accountability processes and other, other related issues. Um, and we have that undergoing as another form of review. Um, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow morning for another, for another session. But I think just the, the key point is to say that we have these mechanisms for ongoing review and reform form as part of business as usual inside the ICANN context. So I think that's probably the, um, the main points that I would point out as sort of the present activity or the work that's been underway is the highlights for ICANN at the moment. But I, I think each, each, each 
We are, uh, as the NRO representing the five RIRs, we are in uh, an agreement, an MOU with ICANN that uh, establishes the address supporting organisation of, uh, of ICANN. So within the ICANN structure, the ASO uh, plays the role which is defined by the bylaws in terms of channelling uh, resource pol uh, global policies in uh, in terms of IP resources in our case uh, through the uh, the global policy process of ICANN. So the ASO has got uh, an address council, an elected body of experts who are uh, who play a part in that and who also uh, are available to provide feedback on addressing issues uh, referred to it by the by the ICANN board. Uh, I'll mention that, the, that my position as chair is a rotating one, so uh, next year the chair position will be, um, will be held by Axel Pavlik of the RIPE NCC in Amsterdam, uh, who's, who's here in the room, and uh, I'll mention Axel is not Australian. <laughs> okay, um, the, the current issues that we're, uh, we're looking at uh, at the moment, um, now these are issues which are uh, very much on the minds of people who are uh, au fait with and interested in addressing policy, but that, uh, that group is expanding um, quite rapidly as, as these issues gain, gain some currency and prominence. Uh, so, for instance, over the last several years, uh, representatives of the uh, of the NRO have uh, been in consultation with the Government Advisory Committee, the GAC, um, on several occasions, uh, talking about these uh, these issues and the implications uh, of them. Uh, the first is uh, is uh, the matter of, of the imminent depletion of the IPv4 address pools and our current uh, by our current best projections those uh, the pool of IPv4 addresses which is available from the IANA will be exhausted in around two years time. Now that of course means that uh, unless uh, unless addresses can be uh, recycled, reclaimed and recycled in other ways then uh, then there won't be additional IPv4 addresses available to ISPs um, with which to build their, their networks. Now this is no surprise to anyone, the, um, the consumption of IPv4 address space has been accelerating so the projected end date has been, has been revised a couple of times. Um, and it may well be again because uh, we're talking about uh, behaviour of an industry which is um, which is completely you know beyond the control of of anyone uh, individually, and um, and they will do as they as they do in terms of requesting uh, requesting v4 address space. What um, the the issue there is very closely uh, tied with the second one, which is the. Uh, Deployment of IPv6 on the on the internet, and of course that that also is something we've known about for for a long time. And IPv6 has been available for uh, for the best part of 10 years. It's been assumed, uh, commonly assumed, that somehow the industry would uh, would just gracefully deploy IPv6 v well in time for the um, the depletion of IPv4, and there wouldn't be any any period of stress or um, or worry about the uh, the source of IPv4 uh, address space. Um, that hasn't happened, and I think um, it's not uh, as commonly um, perceived that um, that the industry has somehow been unable to to deploy v6. It's too hard, uh, even that it's too expensive. It's not that it's uh, any of those things. In fact, the the industry has quite clearly chosen uh, not to deploy IPv6 so far, and I think that's a that's a byproduct of the success of the internet as a as a commodity commodity service these days. That um, it is highly competitive, uh, it's very cheap, uh, the the margins are slim, and uh, and in an environment like that, businesses don't have a hell of a lot of um, of resources to throw into longer term investments. And and IPv6 so far has been one of those. It's um, certainly not even needed today. There are there are plenty of IPv4 addresses uh, available for the next two years, and that is based on on continuing rapid deployment that we're seeing today. But uh, two years, I'd say, is is starting to become within the the immediate planning horizon and uh, of concern for for ISPs. And uh, naturally, therefore, uh, these are these are highly uh, intelligent, uh, advanced, uh, and um, and competitive select companies. They are uh, naturally taking this into account. And we are starting to see now a um, a quite rapid and marked increase in deployment of IPv6 addresses in the. Uh, appearance of IPv6 routes in the in the routing table that is representing actual blocks of addresses which are which are available and uh, and active on the internet, and also at the same time a uh, quite marked increase in IPv6 traffic on the internet. So these are quite early days. Um, 
but the the trends are there, and it, it does seem that the actual activity is um, is really underway now. The um, the thing that we don't have uh, immediate uh, access to, in terms of uh, things like address deployment stats and uh, and routing table stats, uh, are the plans that are being made by ISPs themselves, which of course we don't have access to, and they're often con confidential. But um, in the case of, of uh, various of the RIRs, there are, there are surveys which have been underway or which are being planned to try and get a better handle on what the what the actual plans are uh, going forward of ISPs, uh, so that we can we can help to um, uh, have a better sense of what's going to be happening over the next two years. Two years actually is uh, is plenty of time for a deployment of IPv6 if it if it if everyone happened to move quickly enough. No one is is exactly expecting that. There's a little bit of uncertainty about what happens two years out from now. So those uh, two are the, the main issues that we're dealing with, and they they have been on our plates for quite some time, and they will be for at least the next um, the next couple of years. So I hope that that helps to. Um, to fill in some of the gaps, of course, as the uh, as the RIRs collectively and the the NRO, there are a couple of other issues that we are um, concerned with that I think Paul has already mentioned. One is the the JPA, the relationship of of ICANN with the U.S. government. We're looking forward to the. Um, to in time the independence of ICANN from uh, from any government, uh, but that will happen in time and uh, and in due course. Uh, the other one being uh, DNSSEC, and uh, some of the RIRs and RI, RI communities have made um, statements uh, supporting uh, ICANN's proposal for signing the route, and uh, that's not uh, that's not an NRO or ASO position at the moment, but it is it's one that's uh, under active consideration. I think that's all I've got for now. Thanks. Arvri, I wonder if I could ask you to talk to the agenda items in front of the Generic Node Supporting Organisation. Perhaps you could explain who the constituent members are as well. Okay, <clears throat> I'll try to be careful with the buttons on of essentially six constituencies, although we are most definitely undergoing a, a large restructuring at the moment, so whatever I say is is almost historical. It's not quite historical yet. So we have two constituencies that are contracted parties to ICANN, and those are the registries and the registrars. And then we have four constituencies that are non-contracted parties, and those are the business community, the ISP community, the IP, intellectual property community, and the non-commercial constituency. There's also a couple um, non-com, non-aligned, non-participating uh, members appointed. I happen to be one of the outsiders appointed to the council from uh, from ICAM's uh, non-com process, nominating committee process. So basically, and, and then there's a large supporting organization composed of those six constituencies that are, you know, largely, you know, independent uh, organizations that represent their constituencies that elect representatives the representatives to the council. The council is largely responsible for making policy recommendations to the board, which the board then um, reviews and um, approves or doesn't disapprove in, in, in many cases. So in terms of what the um, GNSO and the GNSO Council are working on. Obviously, as was said, the new GTLDs has been a concern of the GNSO and developing policy recommendations for that has been one of the large concerns for a long time. Now that the first draft implementation um, uh, plan is out, the, the GNSO Council and many GNSO members, and in fact members of the community have been participating, are actually going through that plan, I think it's safe to say, with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> I think we've had, and, and Chuck who's implement them, now we're looking at that implementation and seeing how it, it works with the design, as it were. One of the things that we'll also be doing ongoing after this, we'll certainly be reviewing it again, one of the things that was inherent in our original implementation, I mean our original recommendations, was that we would review how the first implementation actually worked. And so we would look at 
the, the first round of new GTLDs, how the implementation, how our recommendations actually worked, and then quite possibly the council, I won't be on it by then, but quite possibly the council will then figure out that there are policy recommendations that need to be made for future rounds or future, you know, um, new GTLDs. So that's one of the things we're doing. That That's a large ongoing activity. I don't think that we'll stop being concerned with new GTLDs in the near future. We're certainly also very concerned with uh, the IDNs, both new GTLDs that will be IDNs and how that will work. And, and, and one of the things that we did while developing the new GTLD um, policy recommendations was to look at all of these policy recommendations in the light of IDNs in so far as we were able to understand IDNs at that time and make sure that nothing we were proposing seemed to be in conflict. Um, you know, that's something that will also be ongoing. We've also been very active in reviewing and commenting and even participating in some of the IDN CCTLD work and we're in the process now of reviewing that implementation plan also to see how it relates to the, the view we had of, of the world. So that's one of the, the, the activities and it's a past activity, it's a current activity, I expect it to be an ongoing activity. Now no mention of the GNSO and the GNSO Council's uh, activities would probably be complete without mentioning who is, which has been a past activity of ours, is an ongoing activity of ours, and will probably be a future activity of ours. At the moment we're in the process of looking into various studies to try and understand some of the issues better and, and to try and work with the staff to come up with some studies that can actually be scientific in, in nature and, 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 you know, try to avoid some of the uh, opinions and, and opinion-based sort of, I guess, what the GAC calls, let's have some fact-based studies. So we've been working on various of those. Um, I'm personally, this is a personal statement of mine, I'm still hoping that I can can be the first organization to actually find the right balance between the rights of registrants and users, the needs of law enforcement and IP and others, and, and the liability concerns of all the intermediaries. And, and if I can, can actually, through these years and years of, of travail, find some sort of clue to, to that particular puzzle, I think it'll be exciting. Uh, I keep looking for that answer and look for it. You know, one of the things that's good about the IGF is other people are looking for answers to a similar kind of combination of questions. So. Oh, that's one of the things that, that's very much ongoing in the GNSO and the GNSO Council now is we're in the midst of a very large, uh, what's called an improvements plan, uh, which I personally always put in inverted commas because we obviously won't know whether it's an improvement until it's done and we look back on it. And in fact, I think by the time we finish it, it'll be time for us to be reviewed again. <laughs> Um, and a restructuring, and there's, there's been a fairly complicated set of, of conditions placed on the GNSO in terms of restructuring itself to have a clearer definition between the contracted parties and the non-contracted parties, and a fairly interesting uh, formula has been has been derived that we're now evolving into. But one of the most important things about the improvement plan, other than the restructuring, is sort of moving very much into a working group model, a more bottom-up way of doing policy development. And it's something we're still learning about. We're just now, we, we've had a couple working groups where we are, we, where we learned kind of what it means to be a working group 
in ICANN? How does the notion of working group in ICANN actually fit together? And using some of the well-known examples from IETF, W3C, and other places in the world that use them, try to understand what, what it is that ICANN would do for a working group. But these should be very broad-based, uh, participation from the community. We'll be doing a lot of outreach and, and that's something that's in process. So part of that is we are reorganizing and restructuring ourselves while still trying to do work. The, what I would blithely call the use and abuse of, of domain names and you know the any many things that, that, that could fall under those you know some of the issues that people have talked about were the, the the front running the fast flux with malicious intent where people change all the time so that they can keep themselves hidden and basically also the, the GNSO is always involved very much now in terms of registrar, in terms of looking at current policies, seeing do they still make sense, looking at things that are need to be different now because the times have changed and the, there's larger systems, there's more uh, registrars, etc. So I guess that's, I don't know if that's a quite a quick recap, but that's a recap kind of of what we're into at the moment. Well, thanks very much for that. Uh, perhaps, um, Cheryl, you may want to speak to quite specifically the at large. Uh, geographically based regions. And the at large advisory committee is structured out of those five regions where we have a appointment or election process out of each of the regions that appoints two people to the at large advisory committee and a third person per region comes from the nominating committee activities uh, similar to what uh, Avery has just described. Uh, what this has meant very recently in between our Cairo meeting with ICANN and uh, our November end of November meeting um, with the at large advisory committee is that we've, we've looked at how we can ensure that in our own way of getting grassroots information up and into ICANN policy development and processes, that we are getting wide regional interest and wide regional voice. And so we've, we've actually changed some of our, um, in preparation I suppose with the at-large review, seeing as what's happening, um, we've prepared ourselves with a regionally diverse executive. So in the future it will be mandated that regardless of however many regions there are geographically, um, an executive will exist uh, which is representative of uh, each of those regions. There's a very good reason for doing that and, and that is because we very much need to focus on the grassroots end user input into pretty much all of the hot topics that's been described so far. Uh, clearly uh, within particularly the Asia Pacific region um, they're quite passionate um, about the fast track of IDNs in, in the CCTLD world and we have recently spent a great deal of time working with the other support organisations and advisory committees on a number of cross-unit working groups. Uh, we're about to launch into the uh, review of geographic review ones and again um, we've appointed uh, myself as chair and another appointee who's coming from the Latin American and Caribbean quarter um, to ensure that the, the user voice is properly collected and collated and goes into the processes. So of the working groups that Avery, Avery uh, described earlier whilst we had one appointee into that particular working group on restructuring, we wrapped a full regional subcommittee and were having weekly meetings that were in tandem with the meetings that were going on in the 30-day uh, exercise that went post Paris. So whilst we're going through a, uh, a third, uh, an independent review, uh, we're also doing business as usual and making sure that user voice um, is is coming to where it needs to be heard. So Clarify that this is that the, you mentioned Mexico a couple of times. You may just want to mention what the Mexico <laughs> focus is. I, I really, um, there's an ICANN meeting on at Mexico, but just before, on the uh, in tandem with the the next uh, meeting in Mexico, uh, something that we've worked over a couple of years now uh, to ensure that the at-large structures uh, that are bringing in the grassroots information um, into into our policy development processes 
have an understanding of what the remit and what the activities of ICANN is. We wanted to have a general assembly. It's become uh, what's called the at-large summit. And the at-large summit is uh, currently planned to run on the Saturday and Sunday prior to the Mexico meet. Um, all of the leads of all of the sport organisations and, and advisory committees, and we've spent a fair amount of time planning in Cairo um, the types of preparatory material that will be going on because there's homework that needs to be done as well. It's also an opportunity for them to um, develop inter uh, regional and intra regional networking because we have some at large structures who are quite experienced um, in policy development input perhaps in their own CCTLD environment or in their own government structures and uh, they're much uh, more equipped to put in process that goes directly into the ICANN processes and if we can mentor them with some of the, the less experienced uh, players we think it'll have good outcomes. Bert Trump, I uh, talked with the Government Advisory Committee. Good afternoon. Um, it's interesting to look at the audience because there is a comic. Um, I also see that there are other people who probably uh, want to have, and that's that forum, a better understanding of um, what ICANN is about and what it is uh, doing and in the case of what I'm talking about, what the government are doing in this organization. Uh, fundamentally, the governments within ICANN are not addressing different issues than the ones that have been presented. Uh, fundamentally, ICANN is an organization that is basically a pioneering multi-stakeholder organization, and I'll come a bit later to what that means. Um, but fundamentally, it is fulfilling a public interest function at the global level, which is the coordination and the management of this domain name system and um, browser names with a syntax that we've been accustomed to, that is structured around a certain number of sequences of letters separated by dots. In this environment, we have become familiar with two categories, the uh, generic top-level domains, the .com, .org, .net, and a few others that have been introduced. And we usually have also um, uh, quite a familiarity with the CC, uh, TLDs, and the uh, country code-level domain. We usually know ours a few others that are famous and a lot of others that are not necessary in the environment because we are not working with those countries. But altogether, the landscape is relatively simple. And we all have heard about the IPv4 protocol, which is basically designing the way the system underneath works. What is happening at the moment is that ICANN is in charge and is developing, as has been presented, three major transitions. One major transition is the address space, IPv4 to IPv6. Without getting into the nitty-gritty details of why there is this technical issue, <clears throat> the key problem is that the incentive for people to move to the new environment is neither economical nor practical, and usually there is no particular first mover advantage. If you're waiting until the others are doing what is necessary, it's relatively okay for a period of time. So everybody's waiting for everybody else, and how we can encourage everybody to work together and move towards what is called compatibility between IPv4 and IPv6 is one of the major issues. And governments, like other actors, have a role to play in the education and in defining the modalities for the optimal use and allocation of those uh, addresses. One issue, for instance, as Paul was mentioning, is that in the IPv4 space there is a scarcity, growing scarcity of addresses that before were considered not unlimited, but sufficiently in large number for us not to have to bother about the allocation rules too much. When scarcity comes in, then public policy grows. 
the more you have to address the management of a scarce resource, the more you need a collaboration between all the different actors to define the proper allocation policies. The second issue and the second transition is what has been mentioned as the new GTLDs. There have been several attempts at opening up the space, and a major decision has been taken actually in June uh, last year to fundamentally take the decision to open by principle applications for new top-level domain, for new strings. And just to make it more concrete, examples of what such new strings could be are, and this is not a limitative list, there are a few categories that are emerging as potential. Um, you have Names that are linked to cities, for instance, there are several projects going on about cities. Dot Berlin was one, uh, there's a dot Paris, there are dot NYC for New York and others. We see that there might be a large number of cities that will be wanting a, a new TLD. There will be potentially what could be called corporate TLDs. Dot Disney, dot uh, General Motors, John, whatever, with very different uses. Some will be relatively closed, some will be relatively open. There will be various others. You can have a dot food, you can have a lot of things. There is a whole procedure that is being put in place at the moment. I don't want to get into the details, but it's just to establish the kind of, um, not challenges, but opportunities as well, that are opening up. It's a major evolution in the domain name system. It's an experiment. There will be things that will move correctly and things that will move less correctly, obviously. But it is important to be aware of that because there is a very big challenge, which is to make sure that the countries that are maybe the less advanced in the adoption of the internet and in their involvement in the internet are not missing this train and that basically there is not a um, continuation of the over-presence of the existing actors, uh, which of course will play a large, a large role. And I'm looking at some of the existing major actors who want to play a very active role in the, in, in the new environment and it's absolutely fine. But there is notion of opening up, just like the IPv6, IPv4 address space question, needs to allow a fair and equitable allocation of resources including for developing countries. Likewise, the new GTLD process needs to be established in a way that doesn't penalize the small players and the players for developing countries, for instance. Now, the third transition is the transition uh, regarding IDNs and the internationalized domain names. In a nutshell, domain names in Chinese, in Arabic, in Cyrillic, etc. It is one of the most important changes in the domain name systems, system sorry, since its creation. And so these three changes are bringing a lot of operational and institutional questions about how should I can evolve. And I want to close this uh, brief um, comment by coming precisely to the evolution of ICANN and the role of, um, of governments and the GAC in particular. There is a huge question, and we should not um, avoid this, especially in, uh, in the IGF. You've heard it. It's in the newspapers in general. There is a question about what the role of governments is uh, within ICANN, what it should be, should it be stronger, should it be weaker, what it is. Fundamentally, what came out of the WISIS was something that can be called a mutual recognition. Before, you had communities that didn't talk to one another. And the outcome of WISIS was to basically have the governments recognize that in matters related to the internet, you cannot do without talking and involving the other actors, the business and civil society. And likewise, during this process, even the technical community that was very reluctant of having the governments around has recognized that as the more you get into policy making and there are policy issues involved and not only technical ones, you need the governments around. Now the key question is what is the appropriate role of the different actors? And you know
GAC is called the Governmental Advisory Committee. And there are many people who resent that there is this letter A that seems to diminish their responsibility. I don't think it is the problem, fundamentally, or at least it is not the first problem. The first problem, or the first question, is how the actors can fully collaborate. And Avery was mentioning an evolution within the decision shaping and decision making process of ICANN, which is the evolution towards a mechanism that involves working groups. It may seem esoteric, but to explain just what is meant by that, before you had a system whereby basically the members of the GNSO are developing a certain number of policies with the ALAC and the GAC, the at-large committee and the GAC, intervening more or less from the outside and at various specific stages. What is likely to happen through this evolution is a more community-wide discussion. And I don't want to be long, I just wanted to share this with you because when we're talking about multi-stakeholder interaction, the question is not about fixed roles. It's not about you have a little square here and you, this category of actor is in this square and this other category of actor is in another square. The value of the multi-stakeholder processes is the case of the IGF, it's the case of ICANN, it's the case of others, is to bring the actors together to discuss as early as possible together what are the dimensions of an issue. And to give you uh, a concrete expression, when people talk about public policy, one of the fundamental function of governments and participation in a, uh, an organization like ICANN is to bring the public policy angle or the public policy, I would almost say, reflex on an issue. Just like the business will always look at the business model and what are the economics of a given situation and civil society will always have a tendency to look at the um, rights dimension of some issues. Governments have a sort of knee-jerk reaction about any issue to see what is the public policy implication of an issue. And the purpose of multi-stakeholder interaction and the way I can uh, is and will evolve is to enhance this interaction. I want to conclude with one thing. There was a mention of the uh, discussion about the evolution of ICANN after the um, end of the joint project agreement, uh, which is due to expire at the end of September 2009. And there is this President's Strategy Committee discussion that is conducting consultations. We can have a further discussion on that afterwards. And I encourage all of you to go to the website of ICANN to know more about it and to potentially participate in the discussions and follow the discussions on the evolution of ICANN because it's a very open process. And we are here to explain that there is an ongoing process. But I want to finish with one comment. Just like I said that the WISIS provided a sort of mutual recognition just like we need to move towards a greater interaction, what is emerging at the moment, and that is very clear, is in this organization that is ICANN, if governments were to be less present, it would weaken the legitimacy of the organization, which has, in a certain way, is showing to the participants in the organization that it is good to have the governments. And I think it's the, everybody's interest to have the greatest participation of governments within the, the GAC, one, and second, that individual governmental representatives engage as fully as possible in every stage of the policy developments in the organization. But we can come back to that later. Thanks, Ben. Um, Final person to give us some input before we go to questions will be Chris Despain from the Country Code Now Supporting Organisation. Thank you, Paul. I get to go last. I get the privilege of the of the Dr. Touré seat. Um, the um, 
organisations such as the ITU, um, you don't have to be a member of the CCNSO to come and contribute uh, and to talk. So we very often um, have over 120 or 130 CCTLD manager representatives at our meetings. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about, about that because in fact in the ICANN arena, um, the CCNSO is unique. It's a, it's a, it's a mini multi-stakeholder organisation in its own right because even though we're all CCTLD managers, um, there are some CCTLD managers that are government, there are some CCTLD managers that are academics, there are universities, there are some CCTLD managers that are, are, are for-profit, so business, there are some that are not for-profit and so on. Uh, and that makes it a very interesting arena and a demonstration that it is actually possible uh, to work uh, as, as a multi-stakeholder organisation uh, successfully. Our major preoccupation for the last 18 months has been, uh, you won't be surprised to hear, IDN CCTLDs. And I want to pick up on what Bertrand was saying about the future for, the future for ICANN uh, is about working across the, uh, the supporting organisations or the advisory committees. The, the recommendations of the IDN internationalised domain name CCTLD working group that have led to the publication of the current implementation plan are as a result of a cross constituency or cross supporting organisation an advisory committee working group that demonstrates that it is actually possible with a little bit of flexibility and a fair amount of time and a lot of goodwill to create uh, things with uh, the buy-in of every party. For us, what's coming up in the future, apart from the fact that the full-blown IDN policy development process is likely to take somewhere between two to five years, uh, is the geographic regions, which are of significant relevance to the CCTLDs, given that we are obviously all in, in, in regions. Um, uh, look, the, the time will come in the not too distant future with delegation and redelegation of CCTLDs. We will have to deal with that at some point. Um, and we're intimately involved in, in creating as much participation um, or as much momentum for participation as we can, both in respect to ourselves but also in respect to ICANN and indeed things like this Internet Governance Forum. Thanks, everybody. So we, we did take a chance to give you some flavour of the complexity, I think, of, of the issues being addressed. 50% of this room, about 34, 30 to 40% of this room, are actually very active in ICANN. So those who are not active in ICANN will be really the key, key question. From, so in the front structure and what you are doing right now, the theme of this conference is connecting the next billion and today's theme is connecting children or reaching children safely online. My question would be to the whole panel or those who feel responsible for answering it, what do you think I can should or will do in the near future more than it is doing now to reach the next billion, to connect those that are marginalized? Thank you, and it's making it easier for people to uh, to access. Uh, and, and one of the ways we do that is through inter internationalised domain names, and allowing people to to type into their browser in their own in their own language, or more specifically, in a, a script that is not uh, a Latin script. Um, and that is going to have a significant uh, effect. Um, on and, and is going to significantly contribute to reaching um, the next number of people. The, perhaps the best example that I can give you is that uh, in um, Dubai uh, some uh, 18 months ago I was uh, driving along to, the, driving in a taxi to the hotel and there was a huge uh, out, outdoor hoarding advertisement for some uh, property development, uh, all of which was in, uh, all of, and all of the words of course were in Arabic, except for the domain name at the bottom, which said www, whatever it was, um, and be being able to actually replace that with Arabic is going to make a significant difference. Perhaps I can add to that. Um, 
We heard Secretary Singh to that say today that the aim of the 125 million Indians speak English. Um, the rest speak 22 languages and 11 scripts. Uh, so as those people enter the internet for the very first time, what is important is they have either a mobile keyboard or a computer keyboard that will only work in the script that those villages were brought up on. And that's why internationalised domain names... It's, it's not as important as the content, or even potentially even email addresses, but it's a key part of when you're bringing on communities that have got no Roman character experience and, and you're bringing them on fresh field into the internet. I think that's where it's a, it's a, it's a major contribution. My name is Yeah, my name is Siva Subramanian Muthuswamy. I'm from ISOC India Chennai. <laughs> when whenever somebody talks about ICANN speaking group that I saw took place, it was about the same rough numbers. Um, in terms of the role of the United States government, first and foremost, these functions were done under contract for the United States government fifteen years ago, ten years ago, twelve years ago. And the United States government itself went through a process of saying this is not appropriate for this to be done by a government, by the government. We want to put it out to an international process, uh, which in itself is worth noting. I, that's a really pretty phenomenal, you know, it's very easy to take that for granted, but just think about it. Think how many countries would do that. Think how many countries who had actually funded and had started the process and had it under contract would then turn around and say it's not appropriate for this to be done by government. We want to have this international new entity to do this function. Um, the, 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 I, I tend to see the Memorandum of Understanding Joint Project Agreement process as a form of due diligence. It's been actually a form of oversight due diligence to ensure that the new organisation as it emerged and grew was strong and stable. And it'll be the question really as, as we come to the conclusion of the Joint Project Agreement some nearly 11 years after ICANN was formed, um, that at least I think the Board of ICANN thinks is getting to that stage where you can say, well, that due diligence process has passed. That's not saying everything's perfect. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, the, key, the, the, the relationship with other governments, I think, becomes very important in terms of how the Governmental Advisory Committee itself works. Um, and I think it's also... Um, I don't see much support in the ICANN community for the replacement of one government's oversight with a multiple government oversight mechanism because that just, when you start thinking about how that would actually work, that's a very difficult thing to think through. You're very quickly into intergovernmental organisation treaty type spaces which is an anathema to the whole bottom-up multi-stakeholder process. So I think it'll be interesting to see the policy of the new administration but I don't see that evolving in any way that would be sort of maximising the number of other government roles. It's rather going to be the way of, I think, a sort of light-handed approach, a light-handed involvement, a little bit very much along the spirit of what Bertrand said earlier. ...of some technical functions, some identifiers, which really doesn't get into the content area for doing much more. And that, and my point is this, an organisation like the IGF is very valuable because the IGF can... And there was a question over here. Then nine. But uh, would you be keen enough uh, to talk about a time frame in regard of the other treaty, in regard of the IANA function? function. Thank you. Liability issues that may well move with zone file management is uh, what's referred to as the procurement <coughs> contract. It's a procurement contract for the operation of the IANA functions and builds historically on the, on the funding contracts that went to John in opera and John and people before John, but uh, in funding the IANA contract of uh, IANA work uh, from the National Science Foundation and then also from HAPA. The, the procurement contract has a, a five-year term with one year running um, options um, and that, that, that procurement contract has another... So that, I think that's the the background, the, 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 the Memorandum of Understanding Joint Project Agreement, that's been, the, that's been the document which is much more directed towards actually how ICANN itself operates um, in, the, um, in, terms of its, in terms of its sort of doing its work, if you like. Perhaps we can move to the other question. 
when will this transition happen? Uh, as though it might be a Y2K type of um, type of event, or an event that, uh, that that for which there can be a flag date. But um, going back uh, ten years ago, uh, when the internet was a fraction of the size that it is today, even then it was recognised that a flag date for transition of every component of the internet from one protocol to a, to another was going to be an impossibility. So, the transition is a process and not an event. An event. And it uh, is a process which has already started because, as I as I mentioned, uh, IPv6 addresses have been deployed and they've been uh, in distribution since 1999. In fact, nearly 10 years. IPv6 traffic is flowing on the internet as well, and in fact, it's flowing uh, to and from computers in many cases without uh, users actually being aware. There are very interesting statistics being produced now in in case of many uh, software clients which you may be running yourself, which these days automatically up them, update themselves on the on the internet. And so, if your operating system supports IPv6, your client software may well have already updated itself via automatic means to to utilise. IPv6, and um, and so the the traffic is starting to increase, so the the transition is is underway, but the uh, the process is is one which for many years has IPv4 and IPv6 would uh, coexist together on the internet uh, for as long as necessary for the entire internet to uh, tra to transition to IPv6. No one is is actually expecting that at any particular time the last IPv4 packet will fl will flow and and that will be the end of IPv4. It's it's uh, likely that pockets of IPv4 uh, functionality will exist on the internet for decades, and there will be no reason why that shouldn't happen. That it won't uh, produce any any uh, uh, disadvantage uh, to anyone. It is. Um it's just simply the way these these uh, things operate. The, the most efficient mechanism is, and cheapest mechanism is always taken. So uh, the, the, that's a, a long answer. The short answer is the transition has started already. It is underway, and it really won't finish for for some decades. Uh, it needs to be uh, well underway in about two years' time when the last of the readily available IPv4 addresses are, uh, are distributed. And it needs to be uh, underway at a speed from that point onwards, which will su sustain the growth of the internet at the rate that it's, uh, that it's expected to be growing at, the, at that time. I hope that helps. Thanks. Perhaps I'll just make the point, pick up on what Paul just said there. Two further things to make clear. There are 340 trillion, trillion, trillion IPv6 addresses. So we're not going to run out of them shortly, um, as opposed to 4.2 billion IPv4 addresses. Uh, and the second one is that there's, there's mechanisms, global policies already in place for the allocation of v6 on a needs base for, for anybody in the, in, the, in the globe. So there should be no myths about that there is any problem for allocation of v6 to any developing country or, or that people can't get access to v6 or the, the, that, that, that is all in place. Any, 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 any issues presently in the transition are driven by sort of the commercial, uh, commercial and other in instances that Paul mentioned before. But I, I want to be very clear about this because sometimes this, 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 this story does arise. You know, we can't get enough allocation of V6, or V6 isn't being allocated fairly, or, the, or other things like this. There is lots of V6 available for allocation. There is no limitation on who can apply for, apply for that process. It is there is an efficiency. Uh, Sort of rule applied by the regional net registries and allocation, which is a, you know, it's basically a smart thing, which has been learnt from the history of V4. At the beginning of V4, there was not such a rule in place, but but we should not be under any illusions that we don't have a mechanism in place now to ensure V6 will be available to everybody in every developing country if they wash it, if they need it over a period of time. clearly defined as technical, for example, um, the establishment, say, of a triple X domain name, um, which may not necessarily be a clearly technical issue. It may cross over into a policy issue. Could you talk us through the decision-making process when issues such as uh, those arise? Thank you. It's interesting that this question echoes something that I was saying earlier. Um, the frontier between what is technical and what is policy, or has a policy dimension, uh, is not that clear. There's not something that is so clear-cut. 
If I take, for instance, as I was saying, the question of IPv4, IPv6, if IPv6 is freely available, it's basically a technical question. If we're running into scarcity for IPv4, then the question of the fairness of allocation, the mechanisms that are chosen for the lack allocation become, or at least have a policy dimension. And policy is not a dirty word. I mean, it's something that is caring about the public interest. This is what policy is about. Policy is about defining what is best in a broad viewpoint. And in this respect, the uh, creation of new GTLD is not a technical issue. It's a policy issue also. There are technical implications, but the decision of opening up or not the GTLD space or to introduce domain names through a procedure that has certain characteristics is a policy decision. Likewise, and I finish with that, on the uh, IDN introduction, of course there are technical dimensions, but the policy implications about this and the role that the different actors will play, for instance, I just want to mention the fact that in the various regions, there are coordinations or, or um, cooperations that emerge between actors who share the same script. There are working groups in, within the Arab world, there are working groups within the Cyrillic space, within the uh, Chinese space. They are defining a certain number of elements that are not only technical, but also about how they want to move into this new domain. So the frontier between technical and, and policy is uh, not always just a clear-cut one. And the policy dimension is, as I was saying, uh, a kind of angle that uh, governments but other actors can, can introduce early in the processes. Yeah, it can be achieved. Can I take, can I take the question to make a, make a segue comment? Um, one of the, the feedback, while other parts of the policy input are also saying, is that appropriate what they had been put? That form of iterative making of policy, can you implement it, go back to the policy then see how we implement it, I think is a, is a, is a key part of the ICANN model. Um, and it's a key way in which, in, in an effective sense, the public policy gets written into the code. Right, and, I, and so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm someone who's very sceptical of a model which says somehow public policy can get done somewhere else and delivered like the Ten Commandments because it's not the mechanism whereby that will effectively end up with an iterative process for ensuring that the public policy concerns get written into the hard code of the, of the operation. If I, if I can piggyback on this, uh, on, on this point, um, following the question from uh, Chandler Online, um, Chuck made a comment regarding the respective competences of the different institutions. As we know, the internet governance is a whole range of issues. Some are interconnected and some are relatively distinguishable. But what is obvious is that what between the different actors? And I can testify, and I think most of the actors within I can testify of a very concrete element of experience. Um, in certain way, the, the way I can has been functioning for a while put people a little bit too much in silos. Like every group was meeting together. It was called constituencies, it could be con called stakeholder groups, whatever. And the problem that Paul is mentioning was occurring. Like you have a process and the whole group has been developing a vision and then the other constituency has been developing its own vision of the same problem and then they're trying to reconcile them in the end. The proof is clear, and the IGF as a process is an even further proof. The earlier you bring all the actors together, the better. And so the distinction is not the governments here, the business sector there, and the, um, and the civil society in a third environment, even in completely different spaces. And then afterwards, you make one conference and you try to bring them together once they you know, they've hardened their positions to the point that they cannot compromise or discuss anything. The objective is to identify a network of organizations that will deal with certain issues 
and each of them has the challenge of becoming as multi-stakeholder as possible. Nobody today, and I think it's very important to say, no organization today can say we are fully multi-stakeholder because each of them has to make a little evolution in the interaction. We were discussing the improvement of being more community-wide within ICANN. This means that ICANN, as many actors are saying, has a specific attention to pay, to put it diplomatically, to the way the governments are playing their role within ICANN. But governments themselves can leverage a lot of capacity to interact and have an influence. Other organizations, I mentioned, for instance, UNESCO has a very strong tradition of relation with civil society actors and it certainly will benefit from developing a bit further the interaction that they have with the business sector, which is not their traditional environment and is playing a bigger role. Uh, it is, of course, with, with proportions. Likewise, in the ITU, which has a very strong relationship with uh, the business sector, with a lot of members that are very active, there is a key question to become a fully multi-stakeholder organization of improving and finding the right ways to associate other relevant stakeholders that are relevant to the uh, ITU WISIS related activities. So there is an interest in sharing experiences because everybody is trying, I hope, to find the best multi-stakeholder interaction. And the IGF is one of the places where people can very informally, not on a podium like this, but in the corridors say, you know, I have a problem to optimize my process. How do you do it? This is why the IGF is useful to share objectives of becoming multi-stakeholder. So there's another question there. Hi. Uh, off you go. Okay. Uh, my name is Pritam. Uh, I had the question regarding uh, JPA and uh, the IANA. Uh, uh, so the JPA expires in September. You have to take the microphone closer to your mouth. Oh, sorry. So the JPA expires in September. And then you may have an entirely new structure, or maybe, I mean, we don't know how it will look like. So in case the governments have a bigger role or whatever happens, will the IANA be then renegotiated based? Um, 